Messages and two mofers to get buyers and sellers of the fence with MAPS coaches, Steve Sleater and Tammy Youngst. Please note this meeting is being recorded and will be available within 24 hours on the MAPS Fast Track YouTube channel. Currently, everyone's on mute. However, if you do have any questions for Steve and Tammy, please type them into the chat box. Following the meeting, if you have any questions about today's call, please email us at fasttrack at kw.com. That's all for me, Steve. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Rodrigo. Let me go ahead and pin Tammy up here as well. Um, wow, here we go. All right. Hey, welcome, everyone. Steve Schleter with uh, Never Ending Referrals. Uh, sitting here alongside is uh, my my partner in crime, Tammy Youngst. And, uh, you know, Tammy, I, I love today's topic because, you know, this is really about winning the market. And, you know, Gary Keller told us, he said, when we first went into a shift, he said, it's the agents that are putting out the right message that matches today's market with the right MOFR, which stands for make offer for immediate, um, uh, make offer for immediate response. These are the people that are going to win the market. And uh, so, Tammy, we're, we're going to go down that journey today. What are the right messages that we find that will resonate? What, what do we do to get buyers and sellers off the fence? Because Tammy, I don't know, they feel like a lot of them are on the fence. What are you thinking? It does. It does. And it's, it's our messaging and our interpretation that gets them off the fence. Yeah. Well, and, and this goes folks to be in what Gary has always told us. It's our job to be the trusted advisor, that real estate local economist of choice. So before we get started with helping you get buyers and sellers off the fence uh, with the right message and mofers, uh, let's do a little introduction uh, about, you know, who are these guys uh, that are talking to us? And uh, Tammy, tell them a little bit about Tammy. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Steve. And thank you all for joining us. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Tammy Youngst. I am in the Mooresville, North Carolina uh, Market Center. So I'm in the Carolinas region. I've been with Keller Williams um, 19 years, am a bold coach, a co-coach of Never Earning Referrals with Steve, and also a member of the KWU Master Faculty. Uh, so very, very happy to be here today. Steve, tell them a little bit about you. Yeah, Steve Schleter. Uh, gosh, you know, I'm a, here's the cool thing. I think the most important thing about my history is I've been through so many shifting markets, Tammy. 35 years in this industry, started really young guys, 23. You can do the math, figure it out. Um, and in fact, when I started, I started in an extreme shift. And, you know, the, the, uh, there's opportunity in every shift. And, and so, you know, that perspective, I, I'm so excited to bring to you today. Um, and yet, yeah, just a little background on myself. Uh, my sales career uh, was in Austin, Texas. I was one of the top uh, 20 REMAX agents in the state of, state of Texas before uh, transitioning to leadership with Keller Williams. I was uh, recruited by a guy named Gary Keller to lead his Austin Northwest Market Center uh, as a team leader. Um, we grew that to being recognized. Oh, here it is. By... It's this one right here. Whoops. Uh, let's, let's mute that person. Uh, we grew that to be uh, ranked by Real Trends as the fourth highest producing real estate office uh, in units uh, in the country. And today I operate a couple of market centers in the Austin area. I lead the productivity team in San Antonio, where I live, uh, for the 980 agent uh, San Antonio City View office. Like you, I'm a bowl coach uh, and part of the KWU Master Faculty. And more importantly, uh, we get to get to be here today to uh, kind of give you some perspective. You know, we want to help you get to more kitchen tables right now. And this conversation today, I'm just going to ask you to be completely present because I know that where we go today is going to put you at more kitchen tables. So let us let me go to our slides and we're going to talk about uh, just where it is we are going. And we'll get that up on the screen. All right. I'm getting the spinning rainbow wheel. There it is. Okay. All right. So Tammy, we get on the screen. Everything looking good? We are. We're good. Okay. So let's get some buyers and sellers off the fence. And as we dive into this, let's talk about uh, the path we're on today. We're going to talk about the real estate economist consultation. 
Tammy, you know, I heard at Family Reunion, there was a panel and there were some associates who were talking about their consultations with buyers and sellers today. And they said they were easily spending anywhere from 35 to 50% more time with their consumers, with their clients on the front end, educating them, making sure they had the confidence to get into the market, knowing what to expect so they would make good decisions throughout the process. Whoops. And then the, the next step is we're going to get into the, what are some of the messages that match the market? Now, Tammy, here's the interesting thing about this. If you're going to put out a message that matches the market, you got to fully understand the market. Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at some of the ways we've interpreted, interpreted some of the markets, what the message is to communicate the opportunity uh, to the people in our database, to would-be prospects, and then what is the offer that we're going to make? What might be an offer that's going to get us to more kitchen tables, to have more conversations, to help people make that decision to move forward? And then we're going to briefly touch on a pricing conversation. And then what we'll do is, is uh, as a follow-up to this, we're also going to send you a, a full uh, session on just the pricing conversation uh, that today will help you get the right price uh, every single time uh, in this market. So that'll be a little bonus for you. Uh, we'll tell you about that at the end. So that being said, Tammy, let's let's talk about this, and then we're going to kind of get into the meat of this uh, today. Uh, Tammy, what's that in the shift book? It says something about when the market shifts, what happens? Confusion occurs. Confusion follows, right? When a market shift, confusion follows. And there's so much misinformation, uh, inaccurate information, uh, clickbait that our consumers get exposed to that, that they're not sure what to do. And um, it's our job to kind of navigate them through that. And yet that's only going to happen if we establish a really a foundation of trust. Now, this is a something called the trust triangle. And I heard Gary and Jay, Gary Keller and Jay Papazan discussing this, uh, gosh, probably in 2019 on a leadership call. And it was a study that was done by uh, Harvard University. Um, and it was a study of how did leaders gain trust with the people that they led? And, and this was the conclusion that this Harvard Business Review study came up with. They said number one, the key number one key factor, um, maybe not the number one, but one of the key factors, I should say, is logic. And the logic part is, I know you can do it. Your reasoning and judgment are sound. And boy, this is a time when our people are yearning for that. I want somebody that can bring me some certainty. Uh, they're taking a position on things. And I can maybe adopt some of that certainty. And, and you do it in a way that I really trust that you are, are right and your thinking and your reasoning is sound. And then, Tammy, we got this right one called empathy. How do we deliver empathy? Empathy, I, you know, empathy is so incredibly important and it's very different. Some, you know, I think sometimes people hear empathy and they think sympathy and they're very different, right? Um, you know, empathy is your ability to see something through someone else's eyes. Can you put yourself in their position and understand the, the why behind what they're feeling, uh, what they're sensing? Uh, can you put yourself in their position? Yeah. And it's just, and boy, they, and, and of course you got to do that, Tammy, and that last point on the trust triangle at, up at the top is we have to do that in a way that is authentic and where they experience the real you and and talk to us about this because sometimes this is a little tough uh, because I don't know we kind of get in a salesy mode or behaviorally we're uncomfortable with maybe having some of the conversations we need to have talk to us about authenticity well you know I think authenticity is actually pretty simple it's being you it is is being genuinely you every single one of you um, have a BS detector right? The, uh, the believability scale, rather. Make sure I clarified that, Steve. And, and yet, you know when you're in a situation where somebody's not being themselves. And so you've got to be able to hit all three of these, you know, and be yourself. So they know that you are being genuinely authentic. 
Empathy can be heard through our tonality, our voice, our body language, and, and all of those things together are what really establish the trust. Well, there you go. And that, that's why we hold, dedicate a whole session in Never Ending Referrals to behavior and our behavioral styles and how do we communicate in a way that is honoring who we are behaviorally so we can stay in that authenticity. I mean, we've often heard mirror and match, and we should use mirroring and matching to create rapport. And yet if it's fake, you know, if, if, if we're not being authentically us, that BS detector, believability scale, uh, goes off. And we we miss the opportunity to really connect. So if you're a high assertive and you don't like small talk, stay being a high assertive and don't have as much small talk and, and be the trusted advisor. I mean, th this, these are things that we dedicate a lot of work to because it's that's how we are able to win and, and how we're able to win being authentic. So I want to talk to you first. I'm going to give you a resource right here. We're, now we're talking about you know, logic. And, you know, you can put it in the chat or, uh, you know, somebody wants to chime in. First off, I mean, I, I think we can all agree that there are a lot of people on the fence that are stuck and uncertain. And if it's not interest rates, it, it's already overvalued or, you know, what was the latest thing? Put it in the chat or, or chime in that has created unease for would be home buyers or sellers or people getting in the market. What's been the latest thing that's getting in all the news? We hear some say the market's going to crash. Uh, inflation. Yeah. Yeah. Bank failures. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You, you name it. You could just make a list that just keeps going, right? Yeah. Interest rates, recession, uh, all these words. Uh, that are coming up. Well, I'm going to give you a gift right here because uh, one of those things that has just come up recently, you know, has been the bank failures. And, you know, Gary Keller, uh, one of his favorite uh, podcasts uh, happens to be the Pivot Podcast. And, and I'm going to give you um, a link here. And uh, if you want to scan that or we'll put the, Megan, if you'll grab that uh, that link. And we'll put that here in the chat in a few minutes uh, so that you can have that or you can scan this QR code. But it's the Pivot Podcast, and it's Scott Galloway. And Scott Galloway is an uh, NYU professor. And this has been the ex best explanation uh, I've heard for the banking failures. Mm -hmm. um, and it really gets to the heart that it's likely not really a systemic issue uh, to be overly concerned about. It had to do with some bad management decisions and some things very unique to that bank uh, that could be influenced by, by 20 people that could crater a bank uh, because of who the who had influence with the big depositors. So that would be something I would listen to. Uh, and if I kind of believe that, I would summarize it in a point and I'd send it to my database. Hey, a lot of a lot of people are concerned about the impact of the bank failures. I've done a little research and study. This is the best explanation I've heard of what happened, and uh, uh, you might uh, want to check it out. And and that's part of what being a good advisor looks like. So uh, we'll put that in the in the chat here in a minute. Hey, Tammy, I'm going to give this to you. We want to we want to go through some just a perspective check on some things in. Uh, Walk us through what we have here. Well, you know, you're all here because, and I'm making a crazy assumption, uh, that you're sensing and you're seeing that the market is changing where you are. And 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 that, that does a couple of things. Uh, number one, it can invoke a little of anxiety in us. I mean, when you look at, uh, we just, if you're looking at the slide in front of you, we just came off of the second largest drop in home sales in recorded history. Now, that could that could create anxiety, that could bring us, us fear around that. And yet, Steve, if you'll go to the next one, the next one is we're also walking into the third highest year in volume in recorded history. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, obviously we're paid on volume, yay. And yet there, there are going to be less sales that are going to be made. Um, if you go into the next one, this is why it's so incredibly important. Uh, you know, 
real estate has always had cycles. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. And as we were coming into that first largest drop, you'll see if you go back to looks about early 2000, look at, at how many people got into real estate, right? We added 550,000 people into the real estate industry because it looked like a great place uh, to go, right? A fantastic career. And it is. And yet when we had that first largest drop, look at what happened. 330,000 people got out of real estate because they're not doing what you're doing right now. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to interpret what was happening and how to guide people. And ultimately they got out of the business. And then all of a sudden, look what happens again. The cycle continues and we had that same run up and 550,000 more folks got into real estate all over again. And then boom, last year, we hit the second largest drop in history. Now, this year, uh, NAR has let us know since January 1st, 80,000 people have already got out of real estate. Did you all hear that? Right? Repeat 80, that 000. number. Yeah, 80,000 have already got out of real estate. Now, here's what's what's like really, really cool about that is that that just increases your opportunity. It's less people vying for less transactions, which means then your transactions per person can go up. Yeah. Now, what does that mean for all of us today, Steve, is that we've got to look at the market today. And when I look at the chat right now and I see everything that, that you're all putting over there, these are, these are what the public are feeling and seeing. So how is it that we show up and we help someone become educated because when they're educated, they make decisions. When they get confused by what's going on in the media, they don't do anything, right? And all too often, they're actually getting their information from sources that really aren't accurate. Um, Steve, I think you pulled up uh, information uh, around the area where I live. And there were how many different news articles? Like four. Mm -hmm. And one of them said it was a great time to buy. The other one was like free fall. It's a crash. The other one said something else. I mean, if I was a consumer, I would be like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to stay put, right? Because who knows what the, the correct information is. Yeah. So let's let's walk through how, how do we get the information out? How do we become the advisor? And, and let's give these folks some, some meat so they can sit at a table. You got it. So, and by the way, that Pivot podcast link is in the chat. Uh, if you just scroll up a, a few points, you'll find that. Uh, and Tammy, before we do this, I mean, there, there's a, we're going to play a little game with you because um, it, it's important if you're going to be an advisor that you have a position uh, that you can't just be, well, I don't know. You, know. you have to go out and get yourself educated so you can go out and take a position so you can provide certainty to your database. So here, here's what I'm, we're going to do. I'm going to put up on the screen and, and I've got a question for you. So we're going to address the future of interest rates. And in the chat, uh, I'm in a moment, I, wait till I, I tell you all the options. I want you to put in, are you a real estate? Uh, I'm sorry, are you an interest rate optimist? And that means, now don't do it yet. That means that you believe we're clearly going to be sub- 5%, we're going to be below 5% interest rates within 24 months. Uh, that's an optimist. And you could just put uh, OPT. Uh, if you're a pessimist, meaning I don't think we're going to see uh, sub 5% interest rates anytime in the near future, maybe a decade, uh, put a PES, P-E-S. Uh, if you're not sure and you just go, you go, duh, you know, you go with duh in there and, and you're maybe you're in the middle over there. Which one are you? And I want you to take a position. Go in there. And I'm, am I an optimist? Am I a pessimist? Am I just, I don't know, I'm confused. Uh, which one is it? Uh, Robert said pragmatist. Okay, there you go. Um, man, I got, it's all over the place, Tammy. Yeah, a lot more optimist than I would think. Yeah, I, I love that. And so um, <laughs> I got a few people willing to confess, duh, I don't know, I have to help me. Um, so let's talk about this for a second. And, and 
This is and here, one. Tammy, I, I'm going to throw it out there for a second. If anybody would like to come on and share and make your case, because here's what we have to do. Our people want certainty. And, and if we can't do, who knows? You know, and yes, there is no crystal ball. And we tell them there's no crystal ball. And yet we say all our best uh, information tells us this. Here's the evidence that supports that. And we make a case. And so somebody that's a real estate, I mean, I'm sorry, an interest rate uh, optimist, would you come like to come on and make the case for why you're an optimist? A solid case. I can come on. Oh, come on. All right, come on. All right, I'm Tasia, and if inflation continues to go down, interest rates follow inflation. So, um, as we've seen, yeah, you're, so you're... inflation is in check, and it continues to go down. Interest rates will follow. All right, you're you're dead on when it comes to inflation. That is the big driver. Uh, along with something called wages right now. So we're seeing a lot of wage increase. I mean, if, and of course, wage increase fuels inflation, right? And thank you, Tosia, for coming coming in and chiming in. And then, of course, now what I'd have to do, ideally, to see the next step in that would be, here's the evidence that supports inflation is going to be in check. And uh, Patty, go ahead, if you want to chime in. Um, yes, my suspect is that I've been in the business for 17 years, and through experiences between the election year, because real estate is such a large driving force of our economy, I mm -hmm. believe there's going to be a lot of play on the up and down interest rates until we get whoever we get or whatever in office. So we have a lot of political issues that's going to be going on. And we already have some of the builders. I got two of them right now at 4.99 because of the homes they selected from new construction. So I believe between here and the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot of the up and down seesaw. I tell my clients when they start seeing them drop, you need to run immediately and get locked in. When they're real, real low, it's for a short period of time. When it's yeah. real, real high, it's for a short period of time. You got it. Thank you, Patty. Awesome. All right, I'm going to move on because I'm, I'm going to make a different case. And I'm going to share with you guys why I am a real estate, I'm, I keep wanting to say real estate, interest rate pessimist. And, and and again, I don't care which one you are, just what however you communicate to a client, it has to be with such certainty and so backed by evidence that you know in your heart that it's it, there's nothing iffy about it. it. It is. And this is going to help you build more powerful messages. And, and I love the builder at 4.99. We have that in one of my markets as well. And of course, that's not the core rate. That's that's because we have the ability to negotiate and buy down the rate. And as long as we have inventory, that stays. As soon as inventory tightens up, that goes. So let's let's go take a look. And I'm going to make the case um, for why I'm a pessimist in this regard. So uh, let's go here. And so one of the things that we've developed for our agents was something called a consulting guide. And we, we said earlier that, um, uh, and we'll tell you how to get this too uh, later. Uh, we said earlier that, that you've got to take more time and educate people. And so one of the things, and of course, you know, this graph comes right out of Gary's vision speech. And we're just making the case that the 30-year uh, mortgage is average 5.97 going back from 1990 to 2020. Today's rates are hovering between 6.4 and 6.8, which is within 1% of historical norms. You notice that rates only fell below historical norms or, or this, this longer, nearer term norm of 5.97. It didn't really fall below that until we were coming out of the Great Recession, or we're actually in the throes of the Great Recession. And it was there to combat uh, pulling us out of recession. And so we pulled, and then, of course, we've had a uh, an average since 2012, which is about when we started to recover. We averaged 3.8 up through 2022, and yet now we're, we're going to see that trend obviously rise more towards the 
the 20 year or 30 year trend line, I should say of 5.97. And so the question, and this, this would be the way I would consult somebody on this. The first thing I would do is ask him a question. What have you heard about interest rates? Yeah. What, tell me about, you know, what have you heard about them going up? What's impacting them? Just give me your perspective on, on where rates are today. And, you know, do you have any belief about where they're going? And I want to find out first where they're in or in their head. And then I'll say, can I gra uh, educate you a little bit on the past, present, and what we believe to be the future of interest rates? And we can go right here, use that graph that we just looked at, and dig in. And of course, you know, back to Tisha's point on inflation, notice what happened when we were in a high inflation period. In 1972, inflation started to really rear its head in a big way. And they could not get it under control to the point where mortgage rates in 1981 averaged 16.63%. And you notice that they didn't even get below the 8% line until 1992. That's 20 years of elevated interest rates because there was pressure called inflation that the Federal Reserve was using monetary policy to tackle. So let's let's go into this. So in this housing guide that we've developed, uh, one of the pages we have addresses um, this particular issue right here, and that is uh, the consumer. Now, I mean, any, anybody who took economics, you probably heard that um, consumer spending or the consumer is 75% of our economy. And so what puts pressure on inflation to go up is when we have a lot of consumption. And so, you know, the question, well, why didn't interest rates go up? Let me go back here. Um, go back the other way. Why didn't interest rates go up following this period of time? Well, it's because inflation was under control. And then we had the pandemic when we had stimulus where it stayed there until inflation began to become a problem. And as it became a problem, well, it's picked an interesting time to become a problem. First off, why was inflation under control? Well, it had a lot to do with demographics because we had fewer people in what are referred to as the peak spending years. The baby boomer was now past their peak spending years, and they were moving into this cycle of empty nester and retired. In fact, we're going to look at a graph in a minute. The baby boomer peaked in their spending in 2013. Right now, you have a generation called the millennials. And the early millennials uh, are actually starting to enter this 46, you know, age period where they have lots of spending going on. So let me, you guys that are 30 to 42, uh, early 40s in the chat, are you spending more money today than you were in your 20s? Yes or no? <laughs> Proud millennial there. Go ahead, Victoria. Yeah, you're spending more money. You got kids. And then, by the way, you guys that are, you know, in your mid to late 40s, early 50s, are you spending more money now than you did then? You're buying cars for kids, insurance for kids, college for kids. And all that money is going into our economy. And that drives what's called the consumer price index. And when that really gets heated up, inflation heats up with it potentially. And so when we look at this, this is me making my case, is the, the baby boomer, they tapped, they, they peaked out in 64. That, that was the largest um, demographic group in history. And they peaked out, they, they ended in 64. If you lag those people 48 years for peak spending, their spending influence wrapped up in 2013. Now look what followed them. Gen X was a smaller birth rate population. And as a smaller birth rate population, now as you have these boomers retiring, you've got a smaller generation right behind them to fill those jobs. That's why you've got uh, 14 million jobs being advertised and only 9 million people looking for jobs. 
And that's why your Chick-fil-A next door has gone from $13 an hour to $15 an hour to $17 an hour on their sign is because we have a lack of people to fill, fill jobs. And then the millennials, 1982 to 1996, uh, 62 million, another large uh, birth cycle here. When you lag that 48 years, 40, you know, and then 40 years for uh, early family formation, the, they are becoming the force right now that's going to drive the economy. And they are in their family formation years. If we go back to this place right here, they're in their family formation years. Some are starting to enter this period. And that means they've got money to spend. You keep hearing one of the key things is the consumer is still active. The consumer is going to still active and that's fueling inflation. This is going to be a hard thing to tame. And that's why in the consumer guide, we address this. And we take some of the work from a gentleman named Harry Dent. Gary Keller, uh, when I was a team leader, made us study Harry Dent because he said demographics are difficult to defeat. Now, I'm giving you a long explanation. If I, when I sat down with a consumer, I said, you know, you've probably studied economics or familiar with the, the saying that 75% uh, of the economy is uh, the consumer. And, and that is true. And, and consuming is what really drives our economy. And the more consumption that's happening, well, the more pressure upward on interest rates. And so, yes, Tom, we're going to tell you how to get the consumer guide uh, later. It's something we've built for our agents and for our never ending referrals community. And um, so if you'll notice in this, the boomers peaked out 2013, 2014. Millennials are coming on strong as, as 28 to 46 peak spending. And yet they're already in this family formation period. And so spending is ramping up. And so what that means is I'm not a, an interest rate optimist. I, I, I'm clear that there's so much inflation pressure between wage growth uh, and demographics in consumer spending that even in election year, uh, it may ebb a little bit, but Tammy, a little bit, maybe we get to six or six and a quarter. I don't, I, sub fives, I think it's a, and, and unless we have a horrible recession. And yet there was an article in Barron's that said they're expecting a shallow recession. So they probably don't have to take interest rates too far back to deal with a shallow recession. So Tammy, thoughts on this before we move into the markets and interpreting a market? No, no, I'm, I am with you 100%. I mean, it's it's everything that, that I learned in college. <laughs> yeah. There you go. All good. Uh, well, and, and see, I'm making a case. And, and if, you, if you can feel it, I'm certain. Now, if I'm sitting with a consumer, I'm going to tell them, this is, this is my educated being in this industry, you know, all these years, interpretation of the market and what we expect. Now, worst case, if interest rates do ebb back, well, you're going to have an exciting opportunity to do what? Refinance. To refinance. And yet, if inflation pressure gets anything like it was back in the 70s and 80s, I don't think we're going to 17% interest rates. And yet, what if we go to nine? And in our consumer guide, we talk about a hedge, of, hedge against inflation. Lock in your housing costs. Lock in your money cost right now. And if it does back up, well, you're in good shape. All right. So let's see. I'm going to go back here and uh, let's keep going. Let's go. So Tammy, here's the other big question that, that we get addressing a lot is, especially in my Austin markets, are we overvalued? Uh, and the answer is actually yes. In my San Antonio market, the answer is no. And, and we'll talk about how we address those different tale of two cities, if you will, in a moment. Uh, and yet, you know, this is, again, a great graph you can use from Gary's vision speech. We just go in and interpret this a little bit of what the actual numbers are for our market uh, and what they might need. We do make the case, it would be reasonable to conclude that, you know, uh, Williamson County, which is north of Austin, is one of the fastest growing counties in the U.S. 
Our stable and expanding job market, good weather, family-friendly culture make our communities some of the most desirable places to call home. And it would be reasonable to include because of these factors that the Austin area will, with migration trends, tight housing will probably run above the market norms. And so you've got these tools, you know, that you can use, but then you got to counter national, you know, data with your local data to make, you know, a story to make a case for where you believe the market is headed. So Tammy, this is what we were talking about earlier. So right. let's look at some of the markets around Tammy. Now, because I'm not in Tennessee, uh, I'm sorry, where are you? North Carolina. Um, I don't have access to all our stuff. So I did borrow some data from Redfin. So thank you, Redfin, uh, for your online stuff that I swiped. Um, so Cornelius, um, here in the Lake Norman area of Charlotte, North Carolina, median sales price, 525000 now, by the way, Tammy, this is very deceiving because it says up 31% year over year. Yes, and it's very deceiving. Very deceiving because let's look at this. The peak was June of 2022. So this is comparing February to February and then February of 22 to February 23. What well, peaked in June of 22 at 573,000, as you'll see in the bottom. Now, if you follow some of the economist reports on their expectations for where markets are going, this is where you have to be a study of your markets. You know, they're expecting markets like the greater Charlotte area, area to see maybe a give back of, of seven to 10% tops. Well, it's already given 8.4% back off of its peak. Remember that, because we're gonna come back to that. Whoops. So it's given 8.4% off its peak. And then now we're starting to get into this conversation around messaging. So I want y'all to really take in some of these numbers because we're gonna build some messaging around some of this. So Tammy, here's a, a, another slide that's list to sales price ratio. Now you notice here at the bottom in May, y'all peaked at folks were paying 104.5% a list. Today, only 22% of the homes are selling above list price. 25% have had price drops. Instead of 104.5%, people are doing what, Tammy? Uh, they're having to come off the, the list price, and it's, it's giving buyers some opportunity to negotiate price, negotiate uh, concessions, all, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, that buy down of that interest rate, buy it down from... 6.4 to five. And, and you've got room. I mean, that's a 6% swing, 6.5% swing from 104.5 to 98 in less than a year. Uh, so let's keep going. So that was Cornelius. Let's take a look at another market, Mooresville. And Mooresville, 9.6% off peak, says it's at par year to year. Uh, yet that's not the real story because when we compare it to its peak, in June, which was 470,000, the median price is already given back almost 10%. Year over year sales are down 36%. And uh, so this, this is, you know, you gotta get your pricing right in a market like this, because let's look at the next slide. 34% of homes have had a price drop in Mooresville. Only 10.5% are selling above the list price. And back in May, they were selling for 103.8 of list and today 97.9% of list. And so this is where you start looking at, okay, messaging that matches your market. Well, what is the market? And, and let's, let's think about this for a second. I want to go back to the overvalued conversation. So Tammy, in, in the shift book on page 172, there's a a graph similar to this, where Gary talks about something called the safe zone. Yeah. And I would, as we look at market data like that, I'm, I'm going to come and I can, you know, share with a consumer that, you know, what happens in a real estate market, it goes through cycles. And we've got market cycle peaks, and then we have market cycle troughs. And we know that timing the market is a fool's game. Because the point of realization is generally what, Tammy? After it's changed. 
after it's changed. You don't know it's changed till it's changed, right? You right. know, it's it's like that whole thing of of tell me when we hit bottom, tell me when we hit bottom, and it's not till that that someone goes, oh, and the lag is such that we don't see it. And the consumer misses experiences. So, I mean, I go back to what I would be sharing with a consumer, you know, understanding that economic projections, I mean, North Carolina, Tammy, where you guys are, overall is still an extremely good real estate market. Yes? Mm -hmm. Very much so. You have less than three months supply? Right. And some of your markets less than two months supply? In some, yeah. In some. You know, and 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 yet it, supply is is gaining, and it's very much still a seller's market. Uh, yet it's price sensitive. Um, you know, the best homes are are the ones selling. But look at this one. You know, we're what we've done is we said, as with the stock market, timing the real estate market, looking for a bottom is a matter of of more than luck than skill. And we said the graphics uh, illustrates that significant market shifts aren't realized till they occur. The biggest risk is waiting for the bottom uh, in waiting for the bottom is that when market shifts, the direction upward tends to happen swiftly. And this has been my experience, Tammy, uh, in having gone through multiple shifting markets is that when it hits that place, all of a sudden inventory is low, competition is up, people are in the market, and the swing is fairly violent back into a sell, you know, extreme seller's market really quick. And in some of your markets, uh, you've already kind of given back most of probably what you're going to, not all markets. But even if you haven't, Tammy, this is where we have the conversation about this thing called the safe zone. The bigger risk is attempting to wait for the bottom and missing it, and then getting caught in a violent surge upwards, where you have less choice, less negotiation ability, and probably more frustration like so many of our buyers and sellers had, uh, probably more buyers than sellers uh, had, but even the seller was frustrated because they, I, I'd like to sell, I'd like to do something different. I don't know where I'm going to go. Uh, and they didn't have confidence to get in the market. So this conversation around the safe zone, most of our markets are probably there right now. And then when we combine it with the conversation on interest rates, that the, the likely pressure is more up than down, certainly not sub 5% at par. Now, because right now we're still in the safe zone and things haven't bottomed and swung up, we still have more negotiation ability than we will when we hit the trough and we begin to make the swing. So I'm giving y'all more detail than we need to go through with a consumer. In fact, you know, in the consumer guide, we actually go through and I've got a YouTube playlist uh, that we give our agents to, you know, here are the questions to engage uh, your potential sellers with, your potential buyers with as you go through this consulting guide. So, Tammy, let's look at some of the possible messages. You, you know, um, so the first one I've got here is buyers get breathing room. And that could be addressed around the list of sales price ratio. Um, fair statement. Very fair. Very fair. And and Steve, can I just jump in for a second here? Yeah. Too? And uh, you're all going to get this recording. And, and I would encourage you to go back. Steve's really uh, explaining this to you in depth so that you really, really get that. And the more you can sit down with a buyer or a seller and walk them through everything that he just dug into, the higher the likelihood is that somebody has confidence in making a decision, a decision that is best for them. It's not about helping somebody make the wrong decision, right? That's not what this is about. It's about you understanding all of this so that your messaging and your ability to sit down with them uh, can get them to move forward, right? That's how you also capture the sales that are going to happen this year versus just waiting. Well, and, you know, Tammy, what I will do in a consultation is probably no less than five times, I'll say the, the phrase, and of course, there's no crystal ball. Mm -hmm. you know, there's all kinds of crazy things that happen in the world. This conversation is to educate you so you can make an informed choice. Right. Uh, and I encourage you to just, you know, do your own research. And, and yet I want you to have a professional's perspective. And, and again, that certainty, if, if they don't share that and they think I'm all wet, that's okay. 
And yet I'm going to be in a place of certain uh, certainty until something sways me the other way. Uh, so let's go back to this, the, these messages. And so, Tammy, we, we look at, you know, potential messages to match our market. Um, and by the way, this is where you take news stories that support uh, what it is you're communicating. Uh, you know, you've got, you know, uh, in fact, Zillow said Charlotte, North Carolina would be the hot, hottest real estate market in 2023. And you can go to various articles in your business journals, local uh, news and so forth that support this being one of the most stable markets in the United States and in North Carolina. Whoops, hang on. And then affordability. Uh, this is where you can bring some stories to light. There was a story in your business journal about new uh, builder projects that were uh, of attached uh, townhome type things that were going to be much more affordable starting at 280000 so below the median price uh, for single family homes. First-time buyers, assistance programs, and for uh, another uh, approach with a first-time buyer is less competition. You know, they don't have necessarily the dollars to, to do a appraisal waiver and pay above list uh, and make all those things work. So this is their window of opportunity. Uh, we've all heard about the, the housing shortage that we have in the U.S. What is, what's it like in your market? And it's the basic laws of supply and demand and where are they playing out? Uh, the future of interest rates, you know, what will drive rates, demographics? So all these would be things that we just went through that I could build a message out and incorporate. And I'm going to show you a sample of a message in just a moment. Um, it's one we just put together for our agents uh, in my market center and for our never-ending referrals folks uh, that we'll be giving them next week. And what's the, the offer then? The MOFR. So we've got our message that matches our market. Uh, Tammy, did, did all these things match our market? Absolutely. Yeah. We can make a case for it. We can explain it. And then we offer, make an offer for immediate response, what we call our MOFR. And so we would follow our message with something like this. If you have any possible interest in buying or selling home in the next 12 to 24 months, find out why the right time for you might be right now. Call me to schedule a no obligation strategy session. And Tammy, this is just get to the kitchen table. This is just have a conversation. And, and you know, having a consulting guide and all those things doesn't do you any good if you don't have anybody to do it with. So your message that you put out to the market combined with the right mofer is designed to get people to your to, to, to your conference room, get you to their kitchen table. And Tammy, you know, that means you've got to have a very proactive approach to getting your message out. And of course, in our referrals, we talk about the, we talk about a 52 touch, you know, we're talking about a 36 to 52 touch, um, multi-channel, direct mail, email. Uh, in fact, here's, um, let me see if I can pull it up here. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, here's a, go ahead. I say while you're doing that, uh, here's what I would have you all write down. When it when it comes to messaging, think about what is going on in the mind of the consumer that it is that you're looking to reach. Hmm. What what are what are the questions they have? What are the fears or anxiety they have? Uh, what are they excited about? What are the things that are happening in their world? If if you'll look at the consumer that you're looking to uh, get into relationship with and get into their mind and and ask those questions that helps with your messaging yeah right big time big time uh so let me let me just so we're working on an email for uh our never-ending referrals community and for my market centers and this one's what's the future of mortgage rates is the subject line and we go through the lessons from history inflation and demographics uh, we go right into this whole spending conversation. Uh, we, under, we, we explain why uh, the cycle of births and, and the population surge in the peak spending period is going to be uh, driving inflation, um, driving inflation. And then we give some considerations for home buyers and sellers. And this is, you, you, and you notice it ends with a MOFR. If you're considering a change in your housing status over the next 12 to 24 months, 
Let's meet for a no obligation strategy session to discuss your individual situation goals. Call me today. We'll explore the unique opportunities of today's real estate market. And so the great thing is you can take all this research and everything you put together, you build a message around it, and then you put that message out there as many ways in as many places as you can. So get it out there in social, get it out there, do, do a webinar, uh, do a meeting to educate, do a, a first time home buyer seminar. Uh, so one, one last thing, Tammy, we're going to go through a few more things and we'll, we'll tell you about an opportunity where you can, uh, you know, partner with us to get some resources and, and help you navigate all of this. Uh, let's, let's go, you know, this was the Austin market. Uh, are we overvalued? And, and the truth is we still are. And, you know, I went out and took a bold step and I did some calculations and I looked at it a different way and said, what if we hadn't had the crazy unicorn, you know, market where it peaked at 510 and now we're at 410 in Williamson County? Uh, where's the bottom? We've given back 19.6% off peak. And I go ahead and I make a prediction that we're going to end up 207, I mean, 370 to 380, 26 to 27% off peak. Um, and that's likely going to happen in the third quarter. And then by January of 2025, we're back to 418. And, you know, I have to do some hypothesizing because we haven't seen a market like this before. And yet then it goes right back into the safe zone conversation. You know, from there, I would just take it right back to when we've given back almost 20% already, we're clearly in the safe zone. And, and then because of migration patterns and so forth, you know, you're, you're gonna, there's going to be some challenges. Um, in our San Antonio version, we address supply and demand. With San Antonio, 65,000 homes of a healthy housing market. And that was from our business journal. Uh, here, um, the census data indicated that San Antonio had more growth than Phoenix uh, in terms of, of actual po population count. One of our major sub, uh, suburbs had an 8.3% 20 to 21 growth. You'll use the media for you now instead of against you. There are resources out there when you pay attention. Uh, Tammy, and, and just one other thing that I do want to share, guys, I'm going to be sending y'all uh, a pricing guide to help you get the price right just for attending today. Um, we call it uh, pricing with a talking pad, and it's a strategy, and we'll send you an email as a follow-up to this with the recording, and it's going to be a recording of a pricing strategy that takes you through uh, educating a, a seller on all the things that influence price. You know, are we in an improving market or a softening market? Is the condition of your home a model home, or has it gotten neglect or deferred maintenance? And of course, we get them to tell us where it is. Uh, how much time do you have? How much risk tolerance, tolerance do you have uh, for it staying on the market, maybe going unsold? And there's a whole conversation we've built uh, here to help you make uh, your, yourself a great consultant so that you hit the logic points and that you tie it all back to what they want, You know that they hear the empathy about you helping them get where they want to go. And understanding what's at stake for them if it doesn't happen. And building that trust and then taking and moving them forward. So here's where we've been today. We said get intentional about building trust with your database. And you've got to hit all those points. The empathy part, boy, that one doesn't happen much without conversations. Uh, and of course, we teach you how to have, uh, uh, how do I have rejection-free conversations and you know, that's part of what we teach in never ending referrals and, you know, provide clients that are with, with the certainty that maybe they're lacking in today's market. Slow down to speed up. And what that means is study the market trends, get clarity for yourself so that you can convey that certainty to them. Get your message and mofers dialed in, dial in your pricing presentation so you get that price right from the beginning and then communicate your offers and your message to everyone. So one of the things that Tammy and I would like to offer to you guys is we begin next Monday, uh, our cycle of our eight lessons of never ending referrals. And we'd like to invite you. And by the way, part of if, if you decide to join us in never ending referrals, 
Uh, Monday, we will be sharing with the, uh, everybody on Never Referrals the consumer guide. Uh, we will share with you those emails that we wrote for, for my markets, uh, and you can take and adapt those for your markets. Uh, that's one of the things we do every quarter is we're looking at what is the market of the moment today? What are the market of the moment strategies and conversations? And that's part of what we convey uh, to our folks. Megan, if you would put in the, in the chat the link, if you'd like to join us in Never Ending Referrals, uh, we're $39 a month. It's a minimum five months. Uh, we have great agents who've been with us two and three years. Uh, David Huffaker, one of the top agents in our system, uh, took Never Ending Referrals three times. He gets a, a $71 return for every dollar he spends on his database. Yeah. And so if you're ready to take your database to the next level, if, if we can be your partner and help you with strategy, help you with tools, uh, we'd love to do that. And uh, uh, you can go to the link that's in the chat uh, or go to neverendingreferrals.com where you can get a little bit more of an outline and you can go to the registration link uh, there as well, or just go to the maps coaching uh, page. All right. Links in the chat. Tammy, let's, let's put a bow tie on this. I would love to hear some ahas from the, from the group out there. Or if you have questions about what we covered, uh, feel free to raise your hand uh, and we'll bring you into the conversation. Uh, Tammy, while, while they're thinking about maybe questions they have, um, give us some wrap up thoughts. Oh gosh. Well, several things. Um, your messaging and, and really your interpretation of the market is, is at an all time high. I'm sure that you've all heard that you're walking into a skills based market versus the speed market. We just came out of a speed market where, oh my gosh, you know, Steve, I feel like it just fostered, you know, the, um, inability to be focused on anything because the moment something hit the, the market, you had to drop everything and run. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, now it's where your skills and your ability to have that strategy session and have those conversations with people that is at an all time high. Uh, this is where you will capture that. Remember we showed you it's, we're going into the third highest year in volume. That's where you get to capture that because you've been able to uh, really help someone feel confident in their decisions. Uh, Steve, I do want to talk about a little bit. I think there, there's some questions uh, around never ending referrals. And uh, Steve and I are live uh, in webinar style at this time slot, the first three Mondays of every month. And so for the first 30 minutes of those sessions, uh, they're at noon central, uh, the first 30 minutes, we interview a subject matter expert, somebody who is really doing amazing things in this business in our company. And uh, we bring them in and let them share things that they're doing so that you can R&D, right? Rip off, duplicate, and, and run with that. Uh, the first Monday of the month, we have a resident tech guru, uh, KT Temple. And KT comes on and walks us through how we use technology at the highest level. Uh, it's, not, it's not all command, and, and some of it is. However, he's really, really helped our members succeed at uh, using technology as the tool that it's meant to be. And then those next two Mondays are someone else. And then Steve and I are with, with you then uh, for the next hour, we go through those eight lessons of never ending referrals. Uh, all those sessions are recorded. They are on a 24 seven available to you e-portal. So you can go back and you can watch things over and over again, uh, which is what a lot of our members do. And uh, you have access to those, you know, three, 365, 24 seven. Yeah. So all the interviews we've done just in recent months of, you know, people that are navigating this market successfully, you can go access that uh, immediately uh, through the portal. So all that's there for you. All right. Hey, many thanks. Uh, you know, anybody else questions or I'd love to hear a couple of ahas. What, what's set with you that you're going, hmm. Interesting. I wonder if anybody changed their opinion from pessimist to optimist to pessimist or vice versa. Awesome. Ah, uh, somebody did. Carolina did. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to go. <laughs> go ahead. So what one of the one of the interesting things that, that I really got, and I was literally working on my uh presentation 
missing presentation over the weekend. We took a class with Gene Rivers over the, on Friday and he just took it to another level. And I realized that I was doing everything wrong. I was sending the listing presentation. He's like, no, send a pre-listing presentation. Anyways, so I was working on that. And so I was literally working on the slides that we had at family reunion. And so you touched that. And so what I got was the, the demographics, how we were separating from, uh, obviously you got the baby boomers now retiring and then also the uh, millennials and the, the, I forgot the Gen Xs, I think the younger generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what we, we are filling in jobs. And, and so that was an interesting uh, info to share with the clients when I'm sitting down at the kitchen table, because that will make them understand that, wow, okay, I understand now this is, this is what's happening. Well, and Mar on. Marcelino, you, you're dead on because I mean, you're going to show up differently to would be clients today and, and you know, edu educating them, informing them, um, asking them great questions. And of course, the, with the consumer guide, you know, the videos that we'll give you to go with those um, are such that, you know, it's a tutorial. So the first, you know, two or three minutes of the video is here's how you use it with a consumer. The next five minutes might be here's the in-depth perspective on it. So you just have, you know, this right here of understanding. And I and I got to just give Gary Keller credit because he made a study all this stuff. You know, was when I was a team leader, and it was just it, and how it served us immensely in all kinds of decision making uh, by understanding just some core fundamentals. Thank you, sir. All right, Tammy, I, I think that may do it uh, for us. Uh, we thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Thomas. We appreciate it. Uh, Karen says she liked the graphs on interest rates since the 70s. Uh, yeah, make sure you go back and, and go to look at all Gary's uh, slides from the vision speech. There's a lot of material there. Uh, and then, you know, what you can't find, create and, you know, go build your message. We'll see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week.